Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to The Discriminating Gamer. You know, I once broke up with a girl because she wouldn't stop counting. I wonder what she's up to now. Ladies and gentlemen, today we're going to go ahead and take a look at Manila, the Savage Streets from Revolution Games. We'll get back to the review in just a moment. I want to take a minute to ask you to check out my other channel, that is Cody Carlson PhD, where we talk about history, books on history, military history. I even post some of my uh, lectures for my classes on there. Please check that out. Please subscribe to that channel. And now, back to the review. Manila, The Savage Streets, 1945, from Revolution Games, is the follow-up to Stalingrad Advance to the Volga, 1942. Here, the player takes on the role of the United States Army as it invests the Philippines and Manila City, specifically, in an attempt to liberate the city from the dreaded Japanese. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if you have played Stalingrad Advance to the Volga, 1942, then set up and basic play for Manila the Savage Streets will be very familiar to you. Essentially, you have a map of the city of Manila, and you're going to place your American units along the periphery of the board. Now, for the Japanese-held territories uh, throughout the game board, essentially, you have clear areas, you have urban areas, and you have forts. And what you're going to do is you're going to take a number of the um, uh, counters uh, that match those terrain types, you're going to, without looking at them, just face down, you're going to go ahead and place them on the different spots on the board. So you don't know what's underneath them, you simply know the Japanese are there. Now there are several phases that you play out. Uh, first of all is the dawn phase. The player essentially looks at their location on the turn track. If there are any reinforcements that come in at that time, you go ahead and add them to the board. Next you have the random event phase. Essentially you are going to roll three uh, dice, uh, three d6. You're going to go ahead and roll them, add them up, and then the sum total of those three dice is going to tell you what random event happens. Now you have a number of counters that you can then place on the board to remind you that that specific random event is in, is in place. Many of these events are things that are detrimental to the American war effort as they attempt to retake the city. Next you have the supply phase. You're going to roll four d6, and then again you're going to add them together. That's going to tell you how many resupply points you have for that round. Then you're going to go ahead and use those supply points to purchase uh, supporting units, artillery, engineers, uh, air units. You're going to go ahead and place them in kind of an available uh, support box. But you can also buy back the units that were out of action. In some combats, units will go to the out of action box. You can actually spend the supply points to bring them back and you place them with their uh, units, with their, uh, the same colored units, the same numbered units. Next, you have the combat phase. Now, each unit has a certain amount of movement points, so you can move those units into spaces, adjacent spaces, with a Japanese counter. As soon as you move those units into those spaces, you flip over the Japanese counter. Now, when you reveal that Japanese counter, there's going to be two pieces of information. Now, the first thing is its event. Now, you may have an ambush, in which case whatever lead unit you're attacking with is actually going to go into the out-of-action box at the conclusion of that combat. You may have snipers that target the uh, leaders, any HQ units that you brought into that battle with you. There may be a barrage which forces you to place one armor or uh, infantry unit in the out-of-action box as well. You may encounter fanatics. If you encounter fanatical resistance, you cannot win. The best you can hope for is a stalemate. You may encounter elite units, so the Japanese will actually be able to roll more dice during their defense, although their lowest number of dice will be deleted. Now, once you see what that is, you're also going to see on that Japanese counter a strength value. You're going to add the strength value of that counter to the terrain strength value on the board, add those together, and that is the base Japanese defensive strength. Other factors from events and whatnot may also play a factor on what the Japanese defensive strength is going to be. 
Now for the Americans, what you do is you select one of your units, armor or infantry, to be your lead unit. Now that lead unit's full strength will be counted. If it's a unit seven attack, that full seven will be counted. Each other infantry and armor and HQ unit will contribute just one attack value. So you add one attack value for each of those units. Next, you can assign any number of the, the supporting units from the support box that you purchased in the supply phase. So like for instance, artillery is gonna give you a plus one. I think, I think uh, engineers are plus two. Uh, you can go ahead, you can add those. Now airplanes are pretty interesting and I'll get to those in a minute. But what you do is once you factor that in together, you look and see the American morale. If American morale is high, you get another point. If you have combined arms, meaning you have both infantry and armor, then you get another point. So you factor all these points together to find out the American base attack total. Then what you're going to do is you're going to roll two die for the Americans and two die for the Japanese and add those die rolls to your base total to find out what your attack and defense values are. Now, as I say, if you have an airplane in there, you actually will roll another die for the Japanese and you subtract that number from the Japanese overall uh, defense value. Now, if your total attack value is greater than the defensive value, the Japanese unit is eliminated and the Americans can place their uh, flag there and you, of course, advance on the liberated track number there. Then all of your units that participate in that battle are flipped to the spent side to show that you can't use them again for that turn. If it is a draw, essentially the Americans turn everything over to the spent side, you still got to fight in there in the next turn. If you fail, you have to, of course, again, flip to spent, but your highest ranking unit, your lead unit, is gone into out of action and you need to retreat out of that area. Now you can attack anywhere you want, but increasingly you're going to need those support units and it's going to spread you pretty thin. So you can attack as many times as you want, but as soon as you are finished for the round, you go ahead, you do some cleanup, you move the turn marker uh, one step over, and you prepare for the next round of combat. Now you continue to do these phases for a total of nine rounds. Once you've completed the ninth round, you check and see if you have met your victory conditions. Now, if at any time the American player captures every single space on the board, they instantly win. If the Americans ever control Intramuros, which is Area 37, as well as 34 other points worth of areas on the board, then they win! Manila, The Savage Streets, 1945. So this game, as I say, is very similar to um, Stalingrad Advance on the Volga in terms of how it's set up, in terms of how it's placed. There are a few differences here, like for instance, you have the leader units here, which are j just give you some more combat power. But what's interesting here too is, as I say, if you get the snipers, they take the leader into the out of action box. You actually have to roll to see whether they're injured, whether they can come back immediately or the next turn or whether they are out of the game completely. So that's kind of a very interesting factor here uh, that you've got to watch out for. It's something new to this game. But also too, you've got a new puzzle. You've got the, 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 the city is different, the way you're attacking the city. The areas of advance are different. Um, in, in Stalingrad, you know, you had clear urban and uh, heavy urban here. You've got uh, clear urban and forts, right? They're, the forts are like a plus four, depending on what the, the strength of the unit in there is. So it, it's really tough when you start approaching those kind of black uh, areas there. But on the whole, this game is just, just like Stalingrad. This game is outstanding. It is just outstanding. It is such an easy system to learn and to get into, and it is terrifying and what i like about this what i like about stalingrad is it's got this idea here that in order to succeed particularly as you're going on against some of those urban and, and fort areas you need you need you need more support you need more artillery you need more air power engineers you need that stuff in order to take those spaces but the problem is there's never enough to go around particularly when you have i mean if you get a bad die roll for supply, that sucks. But even if you get a good die roll, if you've got a lot of guys in out of action, you need to bring them back in, it costs a lot of money. That's a, not a lot left over for the artillery, for the airplanes. So it's tough. It is tough. It's a game where you are biting your nails the whole time. I'll be honest, haven't won this game yet. I hope to soon, but man, it's it's so fun. This is such an outstanding system. I was so excited to see that the Stalingrad wasn't just a run or one-off that they're doing this um, Manila. I think they've got Berlin, Battle of Berlin coming out next, which is freaking awesome. I love Berlin. I studied there. Um, so I cannot praise this game enough. Now, the question is, if you've got Stalingrad, do you need this one? Are they, are they too similar? 
I, like I say, there are similars. This game does bring in some of the other, some of the, of course, the effects. I didn't mention a lot of the random effects that happen. You bring in certain Japanese commanders that, that force a breakout, that, that kind of like attack against you. That was a little different the way some of those those operated there. Um, you got to watch out for refugees and civilians here. That can screw you up. I think you lose a combat factor when uh, combat value when they come out of the board. There's a lot of really good and fun and interesting uh, uh, events here that are quite different than what we saw in the other game. Like I say, the the, the headquarters are, are fun. Don't bring a lot to it, but I really like the the, the snipers when they, uh, you know, I was originally, the first time I played it, I was thinking, well, how do I bring these guys back in? Do I pay for them? It doesn't say. And then, of course, I just glossed over the the um, section where they read that. So I actually reached out to the designer. And he said, oh, no, you got to, you got to, you got to roll for it, see where they come from. And that's, that's really a fun Thing, see whether or not they're eliminated from the game and they come back. Really enjoyed it. Uh, just an absolutely outstanding solitaire game. Uh, you know, I did my, my top 10 World War II solitaire games of all time, and Stalingrad was like number two. Boy, I'd have to decide which one I actually like more. Because I got to tell you, uh, gameplay aside, um, and, you know, I know I'm going to get people here hear from people about this because I always do, but um, I play war games, and I play the Germans, and I play the Soviets and the Japanese, and I'm fine playing with them. But at the back of my head, there is a there's a little bit that's distasteful there because these were such horrible regimes, and it's kind of nice to be able to play the Americans here in this role um, who were liberators. Now, which is not to say they didn't come with some of their own problems. In fact, during the battle, uh, there were a lot of unfortunate Filipino civilians that were killed due to American artillery strikes. Uh, it was very unfortunate, and yet it was nothing compared to the horrors that the Japanese had been visiting on that city. Um, I would highly, highly, highly recommend, if you're interested, to read James Scott's uh, a Rampage. That book, so I've read, at this point, you know, dozens, if not a hundred or more books on the Holocaust and war crimes, and it's stuff that just breaks your heart. And I have to tell you, Rampage, about the Battle of Manila in 1945, probably the hardest book I've ever read in that regard. It will just tear your heart out to hear some of the atrocities that were committed there and the absolute terror that the Japanese army were visiting on the Filipinos. Fantastic book, but boy, it's hard to read. It's fun to play this game. It's a little more sanitized. Of course, you don't have the, to get into all the atrocities there. Thank goodness. I don't know that you'd want to play it if you did, but it does, it does make you feel good to remember those, those, those brave men and women in the United States uh, military that, that, that risked all to liberate the Filipinos here. God bless them. Anyway, Putting that aside, great game. I love, love, love Manila, the Savage Streets, 1945. Uh, recommendation for the Discriminating Gamer for this game is buy it. Thank you once again for joining us today on the Discriminating Gamer. As always, we ask you to please leave a comment for us on YouTube, on Board Game Geek, on our Facebook page, or on the discriminatinggamer.com. We'd ask you to please like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and follow us on Twitter. I'd also ask you, ladies and gentlemen, to please check out my other channel, that is Cody Carlson, Ph.D., where we take a look at military history, books on history, fun things like that. I even post some of my own lectures on that channel. It would mean a lot to me if you would uh, check that channel out and subscribe. And uh, also, please like this video on Board Game Geek. And also, too, ladies and gentlemen, if you really enjoy the content we bring to you here, I'd humbly ask you to click on the Super Thanks button and leave a tip. How many trees could the U.S. Marine Corps cut down in World War II? And Okinawa. Probably, probably the nicest face paint that George has ever gotten, and that's saying something.